we, we have uh, events uh, all Zoom this semester uh, across the country. Uh, we have a, a big national conference in Toronto uh, every year uh, coming up in March of 2021. So we're uh, we're kind of we have a, our fingers in all sorts of different pies these days, and uh, really the strength of our organization is the students that that run the events, that uh, pick the topics, that pick the speakers, and that all ultimately uh, increase the ideological diversity uh, and the thought and sort of heterodoxy of the Canadian Legal Academy. So. Uh, from that perspective, I just wanted to take a moment to single out and thank uh, from our end, uh, Thomas Falcone and Toon Dogan, who uh, are the chapter leaders of the, uh, the University of British Columbia chapter. So if you have any questions about Rennie Mead or uh, and want to say you're at UBC and you want to get involved, uh, you can contact one of the, the, those two guys or, you know, I'm happy to take any of your questions at any time about uh, what Rennie Mead does. Uh, feel free to go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, Follow us on Twitter. We have a lot of exciting events planned for this fall and for 2021. So thank you again all for coming. Really looking forward to this event. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I'm Justin, uh, the president of the U University of Washington chapter of the Federalist Society, which is a uh, uh, United States national organization that's uh, devoted to uh, encouraging free speech on campus and promoting kind of a, a return to a more literal uh, meaning of the interpretation of the Constitution and of the rule of law, um, espousing sort of originalist and, and, and textualist viewpoints, which uh, Professor Werman from the Arizona State uh, University School of Law is going to talk about. Uh, so we're just very excited that everybody's here, that we get to do this joint event uh, with the Running Meat Society and with the University of British Columbia. We're very thankful uh, for both how Mr. Falcone and, uh, and Mr. Mancini, as well as uh, uh, Tunk have, have really helped us put this whole thing together. Uh, we're very thankful that Mr. Honickman uh, is here as well to, to speak after Mr. Worman. Uh, so very excited to hear about originalism in both contexts. And uh, Mr. Worman, the floor is yours. Great, well, thanks so much for having me. And since I only have 15 minutes, I'll just say in a shameless act of self-promotion, that my remarks are loosely based on my book, A Debt Against the Living, an Introduction to Originalism. Uh, and so uh, I like to say it has three virtues. It's short, it's cheap, and it has a really, really pretty cover. Now, I also happen to think it's correct, um, but that's more a matter uh, of opinion. So hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that in the next 15 minutes or so. And so I guess the way I'd like to start is the best way to defend originalism in such a short time is to ask, uh, how do we ordinarily interpret legal instruments in our legal system, like contracts or statutes or treaty. Well, normally we separate the question of what a contract or statute says from whether the contract is enforceable or the statute is binding, right? So a contract in retrospect may be a really bad contract. Maybe you wish you hadn't entered into this business deal. Um, maybe Congress has enacted a bad law. But very much an integral part of our legal system here is that we're nevertheless bound, right, even by the bad contracts that we've properly entered into, and we're bound by the bad laws that Congress enacts. Why is that? Why are we bound even by the bad laws that Congress enacts? Well, because in our legal system, we recognize that so long as those laws are enacted pursuant to a particular democratic process, that process is sufficient to confer legitimacy on the laws such that they are binding as a whole even those of them we don't like. So can this framework apply to the Constitution too? After all, the Constitution is also a law, a law we the people enacted to bind our legal officials. So I think the originalist position is that we first ask, what does this Constitution actually say? What does it mean? What does it do? What legal effect does it have? What kind of constitutional regime does it create? Now, once we figure that out, it might turn out we don't like all of its provisions, right? Maybe we think we can do that. Okay. But is there an argument, sorry, is there an argument that we are nevertheless bound by the Constitution as a whole, despite any imperfections it might have, just like we're bound by the laws of Congress as a whole, right? Even those of them we don't like. So I think in, in a way to summarize this, there are two inquiries for the originals. First, how do we even figure out what our constitution actually says or does? Okay, but once we figure that out, we still have to ask whether that, that constitution, this constitution is even binding 
such that we should care what it says or does, such that we should follow what it says or does, especially if we don't like what it says, everything that it says or does. Okay, well, I think the originalist answer to the first question is relatively straightforward. I think it's actually pretty easy. At least in our legal system, I think in yours too, by the way, we'll get to that in a second. We interpret all legal instruments, okay, the same way we would interpret any communication intended as a public instruction. Okay, so interpreting the Constitution is in principle no different than interpreting a recipe for fried chicken that you find in your great, 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 great grandmother's attic that it's carbon dated to 1789 and you discover has been written in Philadelphia. Okay, think about it. If you found such a recipe, how would you interpret it? Well, you'd use a public meaning, not a secret or esoteric or poetic meaning, right? Otherwise, it would be a pretty ineffective recipe. And you'd use the original meaning the meaning the creator of the recipe intended to convey at the time it was written. Now, that of course is not to deny the existence of indeterminacies, right? Uh, um, I should say interpretive difficulties stemming from indeterminacies like vagueness, breadth, ambiguity, so the recipe could say add pepper to taste, right? What the heck do we do with add pepper to taste? Whose taste? Does that vary from person to person, generation to generation, who gets to judge? So it will be the case the faithful interpreters or faithful chefs faithfully trying to implement this recipe for fried chicken will arrive at a range of plausible actual results in the world, okay? A range of plausible actual fried chickens. But a range is still a range. It's still circumscribed, right? It has endpoints. So the modern day chef couldn't just add rosemary to taste instead of pepper because the chef concludes that modern day fried chicken eaters marry instead. Now make no mistake about it. I suppose the chef could do that, okay? but that wouldn't be interpreting. It wouldn't be interpreting the recipe, right? It would be changing the recipe. It would be amending the recipe. Well, you all probably see where this is going. The constitution is also a public instruction, an instruction from we the people to our legal officials. So we interpret the constitution with a public meaning, not a secret or esoteric meaning, right? Or poetic meaning or some other meaning, right? It's not a Socratic dialogue. I mean, there are other documents out there that maybe you interpret differently, but, but the Constitution is a public instruction. So we interpret it with a public meaning and we interpret it with its original meaning, the meaning we the people intended to convey at the time we wrote it and sought to bind our legal officials. Okay, but again, there will always be those same interpretive challenges as a result of those same indeterminacies. So I do think it's important to realize the faithful interpreters of any Constitution, right, will often arrive at a range of plausible actual uh, results in the world, right? But, but a range is still a range, right? Uh, and it can often be pre pretty narrow, right? Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think that's the easy part. So are we all originalists now? Have I convinced everybody? Well, Justice Elena Kagan here in the United States appointed by President Barack Obama says that we are largely on the basis of these kinds of notions about text and public instruction and so on. But that argument, I don't think, goes far enough for those who claim that we aren't even bound by the framers constitution at all, because they might say the constitution is different from other laws, okay, such that we don't necessarily have to be bound by it. It's different from other laws because it's really, really old, right? It's outdated, its principles need to be updated, and it turns out to be pretty exceedingly difficult to change, right? So if all those premises are true, maybe we want judges to update the meaning and content of the constitution over time, it's a sort of second best amendment process. Note that even here though, I don't think that makes non-originalism a method of interpretation, okay? I think it makes it a method of constitutional change, all right? Even in Canada, all right, I suspect that you're all original public meaning originalists, okay? The question is what text you're giving the original public meaning to, right? So when the court issues a judicial opinion in English, I assume it's mostly the same in Can Canadian English, right, American English, Right? I assume that you readers of that opinion give that opinion its original public meaning, right? You're trying to figure out what the court's instructing, what the court's ordering, right? The question of non-originalism versus originalism is different. It's a question of what document we look to. It's a question of what text supplies our actual legal obligations, okay, in our legal system. Is it the judge's opinion? Or is it, in our case, the text under the glass of our national, at our national archives? Okay, that's the question. So what then is the argument for why we are bound by the constitution or should be bound by our constitution, right? Here's where my remarks have to diverge from Canada's. I have no idea what your constitution really is or says, right? 
why, what's the claim for why our constitution is binding such that we should treat it like we treat the laws of Congress, right, as binding, even if we don't like all of its particulars? Well, as I explain more in the book, which again, I'll flash here, the constitution, I argue, all right, is binding if it is an improvement of the kind that James Madison described in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, if it's an improvement of this kind that forms a debt against the living. He wrote this in response to Thomas Jefferson's The Earth Belongs to the Living Letter, right? Well, what must the Constitution do to be this improvement and to create this debt? Well, I argue that the Constitution, to be legitimate and binding, at least in a free society, right, like ours, has to accomplish one central task, okay? It must successfully balance the two competing principal objectives of a free society. So it must, on the one hand, create a regime of self-government, right, whereby we, the people, can govern ourselves democratically and decide who we want to be politically, socially, culturally, economically, even morally. Okay, but the same constitution must also preserve a large measure of natural liberty, of natural rights. Right? Other, but it's, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that these two objectives are in tension with each other, right? We all, we all know it's often popular majorities that infringe on the rights of minorities. So framing a constitution that successfully balances these competing objectives is, I think, not an easy task. My claim is that the American founders were remarkably successful for their time at creating a constitution that successfully balanced these competing objectives through ingenious mechanisms like the separation of powers, checks and balances. We have an enumeration of power and this division of federal state power here in the United States, right? The Bill of Rights. And of course, the representative mechanism itself was a novelty at the time. But more importantly than that, okay, more importantly than that, the fr I, I claim, I argue, the, our framers wrote our constitution in such a way that it would continue to strike a successful balance between self-government and individual liberty long into the future on both sides of the equation. On the liberty side, okay, the rights protecting provisions of the Const our constitution are written in sufficiently broad terms. So they're fixed meanings, fixed meanings, not changing meanings. Their fixed meanings can and do apply to new and changing circumstances. Hence the first amendment applies to speech made on the internet, the Fourth Amendment, you know, gets unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, applies to GPS devices that police officers put on cars and so on. Okay, it's almost obvious. What about the other side of the equation? What about the self-government side of the equation? Well, consider what our Constitution actually insulates from democratic politics, democratic control, very little, right? It insulates those rights most essential to free societies, like free speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights in the Second Amendment and lots and lots and lots of due process rights. But other than that, the Constitution leaves, for the most part, not for the whole part, but for the most part, leaves other difficult, important questions to the democratic process precisely because the, our founders expected that we would evolve, evolve and progress over time, right? If our founders didn't expect that, they would have baked more into the Constitution that they wrote. And of course, yes, our amendment process is exceedingly difficult to undertake, but we've used that process precisely for those most fundamental of our, our regime change. Okay, so in semi-conclusion, okay, so long as we the people today, all right, not as a matter of blind veneration to the past, this is important, not because the founder said so, all right, but today, here and now, if we continue as, as the people to continue uh, to believe, agree, and accept that the constitution of our founders, as it's been properly amended since, continues to strike this successful balance between self-government and liberty, then I think that that makes this constitution an improvement of that kind that makes it legitimate and therefore binding whatever its imperfections. Now, be because this point is important, it's really the whole point, I want to restate it one more time in another way. Something must make a constitution binding, right? We know that it can't be that no constitution is ever binding. That's just not true. It's not true anywhere, right? Something must make the existing constitution binding. But it also can't be, right? It also can't be that a constitution is only binding if it says exactly what you personally would want it to say, right? In our case, 300 million Americans could have a different opinion about it. Something must make a constitution binding in spite of any disagreement over its particulars, right? And that threshold, that, that middle ground, Right, I argue is this threshold success in balancing self-government and, and, and liberty, even if it's not the exact balance that, that any particular person uh, would strike. Okay, well, if I'm right, okay, that the Constitution is an improvement of this kind that forms this debt against the living, then I think the Constitution is binding law. And if the Constitution is binding law, then I submit that we interpret it the same way we interpret other binding law. 
with its original public meaning. Now I have a bit on the founders and slavery and things like that, but I will save it since I'm almost out of time and maybe there'll be questions uh, about that uh, at a later time. So thanks for your attention. So do I just speak now or? Uh, or go, yes? go ahead, sorry. Go okay. ahead, thank you, Professor Worman. So um, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Worman. That, that was really interesting. Um, so I'll start by saying I don't have a book um, to, to advertise, uh, nor could I probably uh, write one uh, with as much expertise. I'm, I come at this issue as a lawyer and I come at it as someone who's looking for, for predictability uh, in law so that I can advise clients. And I think that is really what has sort of informed my own, uh, my own view of originalism. But having said that, I, I have read uh, a lot, both on US and Canadian originalism. So um, I'll start by saying that I, I agree with Professor Werman. And I think there's, there are a lot of Canadians who aren't originalists who might even say to Professor Werman, well, you know what, I'm not going to disagree with you, Professor, and that's great that you, you Americans do that, but you know, up here in Canada, because we're different from you, um, originalism doesn't have a place here. You know, we're, we're, we're a little more thoughtful and progressive up here, so uh, you, you Yankees do what you do and we'll do us. Um, and so I'd like to, to respond to, to that uh, that argument that's made that was made, uh, I think, most famously by Justice Binney in his debate with Justice uh, Scalia back in 2007. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that what we call framers intent originalism, the sort of old style originalism in the U.S., would have very little place in Canada. Uh, you know, in the U.S., the framers and the founders are, are just venerated. There are musicals made about them. There are HBO specials made about them. We occasionally get sort of a, a bad CBC uh, made for TV movie about, about someone. But beyond that, we're not really in touch with our framers in that way. And we don't really have the, the Philadelphia uh, Constitutional Convention moment that uh, the Americans do. We have something similar, but not, but not quite like that. But in my view, that's kind of a red herring because originalism is not about framers intent. It's about original meaning as Professor Werman was saying. And I'm gonna argue that it's, it's about original public meaning, but more specifically, or maybe more accurately, it's about original legal meaning, at least in Canada. And I'm gonna argue two things. One, that that form of originalism, original legal meaning was dominant in Canada for most of its history. And two, I'm gonna talk about the way to do that original legal meaning in Canada, which is basically to treat constitutional interpretation the same way as you would treat statutory interpretation. And Professor Werman, I, I think he, he implicitly, if not explicitly, made this point as well. Um, so the first thing is that our constitution, there was no doubt from the beginning that the British North America Act in 1867 was a legal statute. And this is key because in the US, uh, there was at least a debate at the beginning about what this constitution was. You know, it starts, we the people, and, and there, were, um, there were debates about, you know, is this law like other things are law, or is this some kind of higher law? Uh, in Canada, it was very clear, the British North America Act. It is a statute passed by the British Parliament with the advice of uh, leaders in, in the Canadian colonies. That's really all it was. And Early on, that becomes very clear. There's a decision in a, in a case called Bank of Toronto and Lamb. And in that decision, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which was the, the highest appeal court uh, in, in London that, that uh, appealed even Supreme Court of Canada decisions until 1949, where they said in that decision that the BNA Act must be interpreted by the same uh, principles that you would interpret a statute by. And, and that's, a, that's a key decision early in Canadian history that says this is not something else. This is, you're just really doing garden variety statutory interpretation. And around the same time, I, I think one year earlier, there's a decision of, of, the, um, of the High Court or House of Lords in London, not in a Canadian context, but it becomes a Canadian precedent, where they say that a statute must be interpreted the way it would have been interpreted the day after it was passed. 
So you have two decisions that come out right around the same time. One that says the constitution is a statute and another that says you interpret statutes based on what the words meant the day after it was passed. Those two pro propositions together are constitutional originalism right there in the Canadian context. And you, so you have these decisions coming out in the 1880s, and they weren't, the, they weren't revolutionary decisions. They were really affirming uh, principles that were, were un generally understood at that time. It's not as if e in either of those cases, they said, you know, we have competing theories here. There's a living tree theory, there's originalism. No, it, they were sort of reiterating what was, what was accepted at that time. And some Canadian scholars will say, okay, maybe that's true, but then it all changed in 1929 when the famous Persons case came out, when the Privy Council swept aside law and they said, even though those, those sexist framers in 1867 hated women, we don't hate women and we're going to say that women are persons. Uh, the problem is, is that over the last 10 years, there's been a, a ton of scholarship and a lot of uh, extrajudicial writing from, from sitting judges, in, um, including Justice Stratus, uh, Justice Rothstein, Justice Bradley Miller, well, when he was still a professor, lots of, lots of uh, eminent scholars and judges have written that that decision says nothing like what people thought it said. It did not come out and change the law and say the Constitution used to mean that only men are persons and now women are persons. Uh, it very clearly, again, did a garden variety statutory interpretation you go, go and I encourage everyone to read this decision because it's the most famous Canadian decision that no one has read. Uh, it says very expressly, we're looking at, quote, the original meaning of the term persons, which can encompass either sex. And then it looks at the principles of statutory interpretation and it says, you know what, when when uh, the when the framers want to confine an issue just to men, uh, Elsewhere in the act, they say men or they say male persons or males or whatever they say. So here, when they're just saying persons, the, the implication is that this can mean either men or women. And, uh, you know, uh, Mark Mancini, our, our uh, national director, just blogged, not blogged, sorry, he wrote a whole long Twitter thread on this just the other day. So I, I'd encourage everyone to go read that Twitter thread. He, he gets into it in more detail than I have time to now. But suffice it to say, this was not a living tree decision, though it uses the phrase living tree, it was very much an originalist uh, decision. And the, the author of the decision, Lord Sankey, says very clearly, he goes, the question is not what may be supposed to have been intended, but what was said. And then two years later, Lord Sankey writes another decision uh, where, he, where he talks about how, it, even though we have to follow precedent, we have to be careful following precedent because each precedent can take us a little bit further away from the text. Uh, and, and, he, and he warns that useful as decided cases are, it's always advisable to get back to the words of the act itself and to remember the object with which it was passed. And then he adds, the process of interpretation as the years go on ought not to be allowed to dim or to whittle down the provisions of the original contract upon which the Federation was founded. This is the same Lord Sankey who is held up as the living tree guy. This is the key point that he was actually, he was, he was a Canadian, British, Canadian, uh, well, he wasn't Canadian, he was British, but of the British Canadian mold of originalism, which is original legal meaning. Three years after the person's case is decided, a unanimous Supreme Court again says, you interpret the BNA Act according to the ordinary canons of construction. Uh, no indication that this person's decision has changed anything like that. You do not see the phrase living tree uh, in any Supreme Court of Canada decision between 1931 and 1979. For the next five decades, uh, the court continues to do what it has always done, which is to look at the BNA Act as a statute. It's only really beginning in the 1970s that we see this push towards um, the living tree. And I would argue that it actually comes from the American schools, which were very prominent at that time, uh, you know, sociological jurisprudence, legal instrumentalism, and so on. And uh, you really see that in the 70s and then in the 80s, when the charter comes into, into play, that this living tree idea really takes off. But, but even so, if, if you read uh, Professor Leonid Sirota and Benjamin Oliphant have written two 
um, two excellent papers talking about how the Supreme Court still does originalism often. They don't call it that, but they basically do do that. And the problem is not so much that they've opted for the living tree, it's that they do living tree sometimes, originalism other times, and they never say which one they're going to do or why they do one over the other. So it's more of a, a lack of predictability and determinacy in, in terms of what they're going to do. Now, um, the, the question then becomes, well, how do we do originalism in Canada? Uh, a lot has been written on this in the US and almost nothing has been written on this in Canada. And, and my respectful submission would be that you don't need to really go to theory. You don't need to talk really about um, interpretation versus construction, which I know is very popular in, in the US. I think you really just need to look at what judges have been doing throughout, throughout Canadian history. And again, that is taking the ordinary principles of statutory interpretation. If you want to know what those principles are, Justice Scalia uh, and Brian Garner have written a book that, that is for the US, but almost all of those principles are applicable in Canada. A lot of them are ancient. They come from, they come from Britain, so we still apply them here. Most of them have Latin names. One of those principles of statutory interpretation is the original meaning principle or fixed meaning principle, which is that you interpret statutes, statutes uh, based on what they meant on the day after they were passed. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer when, you know, when we hear in the US, they talk about statutory originalism. Now I've heard that term get thrown around. There really is no such thing as statutory originalism, at least in Canada. It, it, that presumes that uh, originalism is sort of the primary idea and, and, and statutory interpretation is qualifying it when really all, all originalism is about statutory interpretation. So I, I would argue that's, that's a misnomer. So what we need to do is we need to look at text, context, and purpose as, as we do with all statutes. And then what we say is, do these terms based on their text, context, and purpose deserve a static approach or a dynamic approach? This is what we do in with ordinary statutes. And uh, so the, the scholar Ruth Sullivan talks about this. If, if you have a term like 35, you know, that you have to be 35 years old or, uh, you know, to be elected something, obviously a term like that should be interpreted statically. It doesn't change. You can't, you can't say, well, at that time people lived uh, much shorter lives. So 35 is more like 50 today. You can't do that. On the other hand, if a term uh, like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, that's a much more uh, broad term that's meant to have a dynamic meaning. It doesn't matter that uh, the internet didn't exist when our charter was founded. Obviously that term was broad enough to encompass new technologies. And so you always have to look at the term and you have to say, one, does it deserve a, a more static or more dynamic interpretation? And then what, what degree of dynamism uh, you know, obviously just because a term is, is open-ended like freedom of expression, it doesn't mean that anything is freedom of expression. It just means that more than what was expression uh, at the time of enactment is freedom of expression. So, you know, if, if we look at something like um, section 15 of the charter, you can say, okay, we use, uh, in, our, in, our, in our section 15, we, we enumerate grounds, but we also say, uh, we ha also have the phrase in particular, before we enumerate the grounds. So it's very clear based on the original meaning that those enumerated grounds are not meant to be exhaustive. So a ground like sexual orientation can easily fit into our original meaning of equality because you can say, and, and we know that our framers did not intend to include uh, sexual orientation, but because they enumerated um, grounds that all deal with immutable characteristics, we can say, well, sexual orientation, we know is an immutable characteristic. So it fits into the original meaning, which is about protecting immutable characteristics against discrimination. On the other hand, we also know that they use the term discrimination. They didn't just use the term distinction. And in fact, there was a debate uh, in the legislature about should we use distinction or discrimination? They specifically went with discrimination because if they had used distinction, then any distinction drawn between, between uh, uh, individuals on the basis of a group characteristic could be struck down, whereas discrimination imports uh, an arbitrariness. Okay, so you can say with section 15, you can say, yes, we can bring new analogous grounds into that section, but it always has to deal with uh, discrimination. Uh, it can't just be any distinction. 
So, you know, I, we don't have enough time to sort of go into, I think, the weeds too much uh, about how to do originalism in the Canadian context. But I think it's, in my view, it's a discussion we really need to start having. We have so many really intelligent scholars in this country, and we have a lot of really intelligent scholars who are interested in originalism. I think this is where the topic uh, needs to shift to. I think, I think a lot of work has now been done in proving that uh, the person's case did not say what people think it said, that Canada has a long originalist tradition, and now we have to um, get into this discussion more and more about how to do originalism. And I, I, I say this with uh, no ill will at all towards my, my American counterparts in this discussion. I think you, you uh, Americans have opened our eyes in a lot of ways to this issue. We've started talking about originalism more because of the Americans, but at the same time, we in Canada have to realize that we have a different constitution and that our originalism can, can take some ideas from the US, absolutely, but it needs to be rooted in our traditions and in our history and in the way we've always done things. Um, you know, I, I think you could, you could plausibly argue in the US that there should be some greater degree, some degree at least of framers intent going into originalism, that, that we can't ignore the fact that there was this massive convention in 1787. We can't ignore someone like, like James Madison, who, who authored this constitution. You know, in Canada, the people who wrote our constitution, we, they aren't necessarily the people who came up with the ideas for our constitution. You know, in the US, the same people who are coming up with the, with the ideas of what should go into the constitution, then are the same people who write it all down. You know, James Madison actually authored the Bill of Rights. Um, John A. Macdonald was one of several people who authored the BNA Act, but there were also a bunch of, uh, a bunch of British people who, who are essentially nameless. I think of a lot of them were probably civil servants. So I think we, ha we have to always remain rooted to the idea that ours is sort of the more dry legalistic constitution that cannot be attached to you know, the great men of the past, as it were. We have to really think of it as, as a dry legal text. And I think going that way, we can go and, uh, and start fostering and, and coming up with this made in Canada originalism. We don't have to look to Philadelphia. We don't have to look to John Marshall. We've got Quebec, we've got John Sankey. So, you know, uh, let's do more to understand our own tradition and uh, let's keep talking about this. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions now. I, I, I hope I didn't go over time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Honickman and Professor Worman, uh, for that. Uh, if it's all right with you guys, I'm just going to open it up and, uh, if anyone has any questions. And just feel free to unmute and go for it. Well, while people are uh, thinking of questions, um, and I don't know if you see the raise hand button, but I've got it, which means you must have it too. So if you want, maybe you can hit the raise hand button so we'll know that you have a a question, but uh, something I found very interesting is this idea of original legal meaning. There's actually a small debate, intra-originalist debate over whether in, a, in America we're original public meaning originalists or original legal meaning originalists. I'm not convinced that there's a huge difference, obviously, because the public would have understood a lot of the legal terms of art to be, you know, legal terms of art and to get that sort of construction. But there are a few cases where the public meaning understanding does diverge, I think. And then that leads to a question of what do you go with? And I'm not convinced it should be the original legal meaning as opposed to the public meaning. Yeah, like for the one example yeah. I, I think of in the Canadian context that jumps out at me is, is, you know, we have our phrase peace, order and good government, which people often, often um, contrast with life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, even though they're not. I like ours better. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, ours is is something that is just kind of mentioned in the preamble of one section of our constitution, whereas yours, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is sort of like the declaratory statement of the American nation. Uh, so I don't think they're, they're really properly comparable in any case. Um, but if you take a look at peace, order, and good government, you could say that, well, the original public meaning could be, well, what did peace mean in 1867? What did order mean in 1867? What did good government mean in 1867? Whereas uh, the legal meaning would clearly say, no, that was a familiar legal term of art that existed at that time that probably didn't have a public meaning. Uh, 
Um, but, you know, people in high places knew about it, and this is what it meant. It basically was this sort of catch-all phrase that the government can do what it needs to do to, for, you know, further the national interest. Or in the Canadian context, we have principles of fundamental justice in our charter, and that definitely had no legal meaning, uh, no, no uh, public meaning before it was enacted into the uh, Canadian Bill of Rights in 1960 and then the Charter. And you really can only find anyone ever talking about it in court decisions, uh, interpreting those, those provisions. So, uh, you know, natural justice maybe had a, had a public meaning, due process had a public meaning, but principles of fundamental justice, I, I'm pretty sure no one had ever said, said those words. And, and they thought it, you know, it's, it kind of sounds like a heavy metal band. So maybe that's why they went with it. Um, but, but I think that's why in the Canadian context, we, we have to go with legal meaning. Yeah, well, I mean, that that's again fair, but it sounds like what you're saying is there were some terms that weren't. I mean, look, the document is has words in it that aren't associated with legal meaning, I assume. So just like in our constitution, we have phrases that didn't appear in sort of legal texts that they were just said. Uh, and we have, you know, legal ones. And I grant, like, as a first cut, we give the legal, you know, legal meaning to the legal ones and so on. But just in case there's a divergence, right? And it raises the question, just in case you're interested, that one famous, not famous, I don't know, one example is from the 1840s. Uh, we have the power in Article 1, Section 8 to create uniform rules of bankruptcy. And the question is, does bankruptcy include insolvency? Bankruptcy being for the benefit of creditors, insolvency being for the benefit of debtors. And people in 1840s said, oh, no, we can't help debtors. Uh, because you can only do bankruptcy, not insolvency. And Daniel Webster gets up and says, people understand bankruptcy to include insolvency and whatever the British distinction was, that's not how our people understood it. Understanding the public sentiment is what matters. Um, and so on. And, and I, mean, I don't know, I don't know. I honestly don't know what the, what the answer to that, you know, it's not like it's a big problem, right? <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't arise at all. Um, you know, I don't know what the answer to it is. Um, uh, I do like, uh, I do think it's interesting. Uh, every constitution is different, right? So what it means to be an originalist depends on what the meaning and, and the breadth uh, at which a certain textual provision is written. So for example, your equality provisions in your constitution seems to be much broader. A lot of people, there are some people in the US who claim to be originalists and that, well, equal protection like can encompass all these modern you know, things and due process means fairness. You know, If it turns out they didn't actually mean whatever's fair and, just whatever we feel like is equal, you know, and just, right. whatever. It, it could be much narrower. And in the American context, this is actually the subject of my second book, which is coming out this month, in theory, let's say next month, uh, on the 14th Amendment, where, you know, for example, argues equal protection of the laws doesn't mean what everyone thinks it does. It doesn't mean general equality. It means equal protection of the laws. What was protection of the laws? It's the flip side of due process. It was the protection, the legal protection you got from private interference with your rights, you know, so protection against mob rules, judicial remedies, when a private party infringes your rights and so on. I mean, that's much narrower, right? Now, maybe the privileges or immunities clause of our 14th Amendment, which there's no reason for any Canadian to know about, maybe that was going to do the equality work, you know, uh, and, and so it depends. It just depends on how broad the textual provisions actually are. Uh, so I found that interesting, and I love to hear about the person's case. That is that is so interesting to me. And it sounds obvious that they didn't do what they, you know, if it's persons, it didn't say men. So why was that even sort of an issue? Uh, and I wonder, there's like a story to be told of how it got spun out of control, like the interpretation. Well, yeah. Um, so it's because the section talks about qualified persons. And so if, if we got in, I guess we can get into it a bit now. The section says qualified persons. And so the Supreme Court said, of course, and, and so even the Supreme Court agreed that women are persons. The Supreme Court said, oh, of course women are persons, but they're not, they weren't qualified persons in 1867. They couldn't hold public office. And one of the things the Privy Council said, they said, no, no, no. Qualified refers back to the section before it that talks about the qualifications for senator, which says, you know, you have to have, be this, this old and you have to have property worth this much value. And, and they said, these are the exhaustive enumerated qualifications for a senator. So when they then say qualified persons in the very next section, they're going back to this section. They're not making a statement about, you know, a, some moral qualification beyond that. Uh, and so that's really the distinction between the Supreme Court and the Privy Council. 
Um, and th this is really good too, because a lot of people say the Supreme Court said women are not persons, and then the Privy Council said they are persons. So the Supreme Court never actually said women are not persons. They said they're not qualified to be senators. Um, and, and just to, to your point- So wait, about, what, so what did the provision, what were the qualifications? What was the well, exact language? You're the, putting me on the spot. It's <laughs> of the senator, of the there, senator provision? Did it I, include I male? That, well, no, it just says that anyone who, you know, like you have to, you have to hold, no, yeah, so it doesn't mention sex. Like that's the key thing. It says you have to own a certain amount of real property. Uh, you have to be, you have to be of a certain age. And the whole idea is that our Senate uh, even more than yours, it was supposed to be this much more high-minded body of sober second thought. It, it, it's an appointed chamber; it's not an elected chamber. So this is where, this is where the you know, uh, it, it, what it was not hereditary. So it was sort of this idea that it'll lie somewhere between the House of Lords and the American Senate, um, which is basically what we always did in Canada. We said, well, the Brits do this, the Americans do that, so we'll do this. Um, and, and so none of those qualifications speak to, speak to sex. And so Lord Sankey says, well, these are the qualifications. They're not about, they're not about sex slash gender. So obviously, you know, when they say qualified persons, they're just saying persons who meet these qualifications. The Supreme Court took sort of an original intent view and they said, what would the framers have wanted? Uh, would they have thought that women were qualified? And that's why Lord Sankey says it's not the issue is not what was intended, it's what was said. Um, and, That's so uh, interesting. It's not even, but it's not even intent, right? It's really, it's original expected application is what we would call right. it here. Like, yeah, sure. but, but why are we bound by that? You know, facts change all the time. Like on, on that reasoning, our first amendment would not apply to the internet, you know? Exactly. That's that kind of reasoning, which just seems crazy to me. I mean. Yeah, and, 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 and really what happens in the person's case is that the Privy Council basically says to the Supreme Court, without using these words, obviously, you're doing originalism wrong. You're doing statutory interpretation wrong. You, you, know, you, you look at what this term means in its statute. Um, you shouldn't even really be going to, to that much uh, extraneous evidence anyways. And it's clear based on the text and context of, of the statute that this is what, this is what it means. Really I, I just wanted to speak too to another point you made, which is about, you know, um, how different our constitution is. So our equality provision not only speaks about equal protection, it also speaks about equal benefit of the law. And that's, that's a key difference. And it's clear that the drafters of section 15 wanted to expand equality from what it was in our, in our statutory bill of rights, which did only mention protection. Uh, well, I think it had equality before the law, and, and maybe under and it had protection, but it didn't have benefit. And so adding benefit was like, was a really uh, a key change there. And then the other big distinction is that we don't just have one constitution, one constitutional document. We've got a ton of constitutional documents. We have, we have the two main ones. We have the, the Constitution Act 1867, which used to be called the BNA Act. We have the Constitution Act 1982, which has the charter. And then we have a ton of other small acts too, like every time a province is created, the act creating that province is part of the constitution. Um, it's, it's not tacked on as an amendment to, to the constitution. And then the Supreme Court, uh, you know, about seven years ago, turned its own enabling statute into a constitutional statute. So, you know, we're getting new constitutions all the time in this country. <laughs> and so when you talk about what, what, what the, who the framers are, there's different framers for each one. Um, there's not a lot of people who are alive in both 1867 and 1982. Um. It's just like, I mean, so again, halfway between the Brits and the American system. The British system is an unwritten system, but they don't mean that the rules aren't written somewhere. They are. They're just written in numerous series of documents, right, that will get their meanings, right? So. And, and, we, and we have an unwritten element to our constitution as well. There's no doubt about that. And it, and it, it, it the best way to think of it, I think, is that it, it coexists alongside the text. Um, and I think we are more comfortable in Canada than you guys are in the U.S. about talking about unwritten principles. Like before 1982, there was no mention of prime minister anywhere in our, constitu in our written constitution. It was just part of, part of convention uh, that, that we had a prime minister. Um, and there are different opinions in this country about what the binding nature of those conventions are. 
So that, that, that in itself is, is a big area, I think, where Canadian originalist thought would completely de deviate from the U.S. Um, you know, can con how much can conventions evolve? Conventions probably can evolve, and arguably that is what Lord Sankey is talking about in persons when he says living tree. Because what that decision is really about is, is the governor general's authority to appoint women to the Senate. It's not even really about the, a woman's right to go to the Senate. It's about the governor general's authority. And arguably what he's saying is even though under the British common law, women didn't hold public office, the governor general's role, uh, you know, the convention of what the governor general can do can evolve over time. And, and that's, yeah. you know, that kind of living tree is perfectly reasonable. That's different from saying that the words in the written constitution can evolve. Yeah, and just so you know, we see we might have unwritten customs too. That you know, small C constitution, like maybe there sh should never be more or less than nine Supreme Court justices. You know, right. for example, doesn't say that anywhere, right? Um, well, we're running out of time, so I saw. Uh, I see. Um, I mean, Margot has. Yeah, sorry, we didn't take any questions. <laughs> has her microphone unmuted? I don't know if that means she wants to ask a question, but. Oh. To ask. Just, just thanks everyone for having the thanks everyone for hosting the discussion today. Yeah, thank you for having us. I actually okay. did have a quick question and perhaps maybe other people are shy, but it, it kind of goes to this concept of unwritten principles. Um, that I'm I'm just not entirely convinced that originalism can properly account for. And so just, just very, very briefly, there's a there's a there's a US Supreme Court case in 1936 called Curtis Wright. And just to read briefly from that decision, that is a decision about the foreign affairs uh, power of the U.S. presidency. And the U.S. Supreme Court in that case, back in 36, they write, the powers to declare and wage war, to conclude peace, to make treaties, to maintain diplomatic relations with other sovereignties, if they had never been mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, would have been vested in the federal government as necessary concomitants of nationality. So if none of these powers were expressly confirmed in the Constitution, nevertheless, they exist as inherently separable from the concept of nationality. This, this court has recognized, and each of the cases cited have found the warrant for its conclusions, not in the provisions of the Constitution, but in the law of nations. And so it seems to me that constitutions as inherently political documents that have to do with the sovereignty of the state, it is a different thing from reading a contract and that ultimately there are going to be these principles, often stretching back to antiquity that will draw upon sources of international law and politics that I just, I, I just don't know, how does an originalist account for this? And how, how for example, would an originalist judge, so there's, a, so there's a jurisdiction out there that has a constitution written down, but makes no mention of like, who makes war, who signs a treaty? Do, do the originalist judge just say, well, I guess no one has that power. That would be absurd, right? Obviously, in a, in a sovereign state, the very nature of sovereignty, just as understood, would suggest that some power in the state would have, some actor in the state would have that power, because that's what sovereignty means. But would an originalist judge in a jurisdiction where a constitution doesn't make any explicit mention of it, just sort of shrug his or her shoulders and say, oh, well, I guess no one has that power. I'm just wondering how, and you can see perhaps that I'm a little bit skeptical of originalism, I'm just wondering how an originalist would, would respond to this. How, how would they, how yeah, would they? Well, yeah, I mean, the first thing uh, I would say is I just published last week an article in the Duke Law Journal called In Search of Prerogative, which explains where those powers actually are in the United States Constitution. I actually don't believe that they're vested in the president by virtue of executive vesting clause, you know, um, or some inherent attributes of sovereignty. I that. I think all the historical prerogative powers were assigned somewhere. Um, and so that's the first thing I would say. It's like if our constitution were really missing something so critical, like you would think we would have plugged that gap at some point. I mean, we did amend it 27 times, right? So, you know, there, there's one thing to say uh, uh, there. But then the other thing is, you know, sometimes, you know, the constitution doesn't answer this particular question. And then it's just the law of political uh, force that answers it. Okay, if you're invaded and it's like, oh shoot, our constitution doesn't allow this, then I guess we're no longer governed by that constitution. Maybe now we have a new constitutional system, right, in which people, uh, you know, might will make right, and I and so be it. I mean, sometimes sometimes that happens. This doesn't that doesn't change the question 
as to does the power to respond to that invasion say, is that specifically vested by the constitution somewhere? The answer might be it's not. It's not. This is a flaw. It's a defect. It's unaccounted for. And now the law of political force takes over. I mean, why, why isn't that, you know, a way to analyze it instead of trying to, you know, uh, um, trying to wedge, you know, um, like events of political necessity or political force um, into text that can't otherwise bear it. I mean, you could have a flawed system. You could have a flawed constitution. I don't think it changes what the text of it means. Maybe what you're suggesting is, okay, we have, we have a different constitutional system where the rules come from somewhere other than the text, including political necessity and political reality. That's fine. That could be your constitutional system. I don't think that makes you less originalist in terms of how you interpret the constitution itself. I think, I don't know, those are my, that's a very thought provoking because again, like our constitution would have collapsed long ago without those powers or it would have probably been amended to include them, right? So it's, it's tough to answer, but, but very, very, very thought provoking. I, I, and I would say, like, let's bring this back again to first principles. Originalism is a theory of interpretation of text by definition. Um, so your point speaks, I think, to the limits of originalism, but not to its value. Uh, you can have a similar problem with statutes. You can say, well, this, this issue isn't covered in the statute. And what do we do when that happens? We go to common law. Uh, so I'm perfectly willing to accept that there are conventions that can exist or people have talked about common law constitutionalism uh, that, can, that can fill in gaps. And maybe those conventions evolve or maybe they are, um, they are what they are at the beginning and they, they can never change. Uh, and, and as I was saying before, I think the, prime, the existence of the prime minister, the existence of cabinet are arguably um, among those examples. But I don't think it's, it's an argument against originalism to say, that the prime minister is not mentioned in the constitution because all that says is that the constitution, the written constitution doesn't cover every constitutional subject. Um, all we're saying with originalism is that when you're dealing with the written part of the constitution, this is how you interpret it. It doesn't mean that there can't be non-written parts that are either interpreted in a similar way or completely differently. It's, it's saying that when we're doing text, this is how we do text. I like that answer better than mine. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks to everyone for having us. I mean, oh, go ahead, Justin. No, I was just going to say the same thing. Thank you both of you for coming and for doing this today. Uh, and thanks for everyone that helped uh, put this together. And thank you to everybody for attending. This was great.